Peter, we're back. And Marshall, I thought maybe uh, in this last hour we could talk about where it is, uh, when we expect its arrival, and what people should be doing, whether they believe that this is coming or not. It's not a bad idea to prepare, but go ahead. Uh -oh, hold on just a second before we turn Marshall loose. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, big fella. <laughs> Something I do want to say, and, and here I, I always give credit where credit is due, and I want to say kudos to Marshall on his work. Uh, just about a year ago, it'll be a year ago in the beginning of July, that I did a, 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 an interview with Alfred Weber uh, on the 2013 to 2017 timeline. And in that timeline, I laid out the Tetrid moons, which we have entered as of this year, and as I said earlier, and the different events that we could expect to happen under the Tetrid moon cycle as it comes around. Now, the fact that, th that they are Tetrid moons is unusual enough. In other words, there are four full lunar eclipses in a row without any partial lunar eclipses at all. Interestingly enough, during the same time period, there are four solar eclipses, two full, two partial. Uh, the full solar eclipse, uh, the, the next full solar eclipse happens on Nisan 1, 2015, uh, two weeks before the blood moon of Passover. So you've got these, now, now the, the, what's even more bizarre is that this started off on a synchronization with the Gregorian calendar of essentially the same date, April 14th, Nisan 14th. Uh, never happened before. Uh, the blood moons are unusual enough, but now they're all on Hebrew holidays, the two most high holidays of the Hebrew calendar year, for two years in a row. Extremely unusual. They end on a, the day before the historic, the, the most accepted historic date for Jesus' birth. They end on October, to, I'm sorry, on September 28th. The, the accepted, most historic accepted date for Jesus' birth is September 29th. The, the following uh, uh, Passover is misdated. It's coming a month late. However, I'm going to go back to, to this video that, that we did, and, and you can make reference to it because it's not about the, the timeline. It's about specifically about this event. Uh, he, here's the situation. The timeline falls out almost perfectly for what Revelation 6, 12 through 17 could only be described as, as the Nibiru event. And that's what makes this so peculiar uh, in, in not a uh, strange way, but in a timing of events. I don't believe in coincidence. Coincidences are two things happening at the same time. But let's look for historic precedent. And when we do, we, the, the, the last historic president, precedent was at the time of Egypt's uh, the, the uh, liberation of the tribe of Israel from Egyptian control back during the Exodus. But the, the, interesting, when you read the wording that is used by Ju in uh, Revelation, the sixth chapter, uh, in the twelfth verse, it's interesting how, how it starts off. And, and then, Marshall, I'll, I'm gonna, after I read this, I'm going to read this to you. Okay. It, sa it says that, I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth like a green figs falling from trees shaken by mighty winds. And the sky was rolled up like a scroll and taken away. And all of the mountains and all of the islands disappeared. And the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy people, the people with great power, and every slave and every free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rock masses of the mountains. And they cried out to the mountains and to the rocks, fall over us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to survive? Now, uh, when you go back to the first Gulf War, Norman Sh Schwarzkopf carried out what was called shock and awe. He took out his enemy's eyes, he took out his enemy's ears and speech, and then he took out his enemy, and that war was measured in hours, not weeks, months, or years. Of course, it led to a war that's yeah. never ending there since. But you see, once this Nibiru event or Planet X event happens, we can pretty much kiss all communications goodbye. And the event itself is timed according to the prophecies. And so I cannot ignore your message, Marshall. I cannot ignore it. 
I can't either because it's hard data, and and I love that stuff. It's like it's, yeah, it's synchronicity. It's is a coincidence. It's one hell of a coincidence. Yeah, because it's it's this event which takes out the eyes and ears of the military and all their advanced weapons and all their goodies that they intend uh, on using against the people and whoever might be showing up, and it puts everything in the hands of a higher power. Think about that. An off planet higher power. Call it what you want, but we are going to be impressed with what happens by the time it's all over, at least those of us who survive it. Well, you know, that's that's my bag is, you know, I want people to survive it. What I see, and I talk about this in this article, it's time to look up on my site. I posted it this morning on yowza.com, Y-O-W-U-S-A.com, and I really give people the big bada bing of what's really important, why they should be looking. And uh, because in my video, I have a guy from, uh, North Carolina, Richard Bowler, who made two observations of Nibiru, and uh, the chemtrail spring was really hard, and so he got to see it in between chemtrail spring from two different locations in the same city on two different dates. And uh, the interesting thing was we correlated those two being in the same area of the sky as we were observing Nibiru from Turialba, and we also show that in the video. But what I'm the point I'm trying to get across to people is that when I look at what the elites are doing, I see a completely different scenario than what I see with the common man. The common man is just all over the map, and they're in denial, and they don't want to. And, you know, interestingly enough, the Bible tells us exactly that's what's going to happen. People are going to be deceived because they want to be deceived. Um, and it's going to be the rare few that are not. Uh, so it's a pandemic of denial. But for the elites, uh, they've got a long-term strategy. And... What they're seeing is right now in the present day world, the elites who control this world, if it were a poker game, they're holding a royal flush. You're not gonna beat their hand. So carping and complaining about it and all the injustices and so forth, why bother? They're gonna win and they're gonna do whatever they wanna do. Mar Marshall, if I might just interject here for a second. When I, just about the same time as I finished, was done writing literature, I think I was in the process of having the uh, editing done. I made friends with an heiress to the Moresque shipping line. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was while they were, when they were having those really bad forest fire, fires in Greece. She, mm -hmm. was, she was on her yacht out in the Mediterranean, uh, and we were communicating via who knows how she was hooked up to the Internet. And I was like, I, I, when she told me her name, I said, I, I've seen your family, I've seen your name before. She said, yeah, we move things. <laughs> I'm like, okay, whatever. But she had said this, and I said, well, we got on the subject of, of Armageddon. And she says, oh, yes, we're, we've, we know well of Armageddon. Not worried about it at all. She says, I can, I've got a place to go where I can stay for 18 months and live totally happily without any problem whatsoever, with no inconvenience. This is a woman who's, who's heir is to uh, one of the largest shipping lines on the face of the earth. They, they're commercial movers. You see their trucks or, or their, their containers going up and down the highways of the world, literally. Right. At least I have. Uh, and, and she, yep. But this is what, uh, seven, eight years ago, I published, uh, seven years ago, this was. And yep, we, we know all about Armageddon. We are all ready for it. I live very comfortably for 18 months. You know what? She will live comfortably for 18 months, and then it's not going to be so good because what we're looking at now, uh, looking at the, the way these objects are moving through the sky, uh, we're talking about a catastrophe that's going to last a decade. All right. So all of these bunker bunnies, we call them bunker bunnies because they're, they all are, they've got these luxury underground condominiums and they're going to sit down there for two years eating MREs and watching the sound of music. Uh, when they come up, they're not going to know what life has become on the surface. And they are going to be, real easy targets. They are going to stand out like sore thumbs for renegades, rogues, uh, marauders, and, and the worst of it is that there will be cannibalism and the cannibals are going to go for the bunker bunnies because they're going to be sweet meat. They're not going to be living on uh, tree bark and worms. They're going to be eating, eating well. Uh, they're going to be easy to spot. They'll smell them at a distance because their body chemistries are going to be so much different than everyone on the surface. So the bunker bunnies are not going to fare as well as they think. They have bought themselves oh, yeah. into a short-term delusion. The people that are really going to survive are the ones that are going to be on the surface. And 
here's where the elites are concerned because the big elites, the ones that are running the world, uh, these are the guys that their bunker systems are designed for a decade or more. They're self-sustaining. They can go the long haul. Uh, when they do come back up to the surface, what they're going to want to do is re-exert their uh, dominion over the planet. Now, what they're going to do is you can go research like the Svalbard Seed Vault. Well, Bill Gates, the most successful monopolist in the world, is the poster child for it, and it's underwritten by Monsanto. You know, these people are, you know, not known for compassion and love. Uh, they're globalists, and, you know, it's they want to devour the world. And so what they'll do is uh, they'll come back up to the surface and they know in a post-historic world, they're not holding a winning hand, that the people who actually endure it on the ground, uh, they're the ones that are going to hold the winning hand. Not that they'll probably understand it, because they're going to mostly be young people who are going into it are going to know everything that they remember about Beyonce and uh, very little about how things in the world really work. And so when the elites come up to the surface, they'll beguile them with uh, trinkets and baubles, uh, seeds, medicine, technology, and so forth. And here, sign on the dotted line. And what people are really going to sign away is going to be their freedom. They're going to sign themselves into slavery. And if that happens, if that is successful, then if you want to know what the world is going to be like after the pole shift and after Nibiru, if the elites are allowed to, uh, if we don't call their bluff, just simply call their bluff. If we don't do that and we're stupid enough to sell our birthright for a bowl of lentils, what will the world look like? Go rent Hunger Games. That's exactly what it's going to be. It's going to be a horrific, uh, you know, class warfare kind of thing with uh, a whole lot of very poor, hungry slaves and uh, elites who are, you know, into their nonsense and maintaining their power. On the other hand, if the people who do survive this, all right, are knowledgeable enough to understand what's really happening, then they are going to know who the elites really are. They're not going to be beguiled. And so that is the real important reason why people need to come aware of Nibiru, what's happening, the kind of things that we're talking about, because if they are aware now, they'll carry this knowledge with them. And when they're on the backside, uh, you know, and keep in mind, it's people in their 20s who are going to be the principal survivors of this because they're going to have the physical strength and enough life experience to make it. But what they're going to remember of this world is Beyonce and their student loans. They're not going to know anything about what we're talking about in this conversation. But if they do, and there's enough of them that know, and they know that this is what the elites do and how they manipulate people, they're not going to sell their birthright for a bowl of lentils, and we wind up becoming a slave species for, you know, more generations than we care to imagine. And that is, that for me is the real concern, because the elites right now, they are already prepared for what is coming. They have been for some time. They're working on the backside situation. They know that in this reality, they've got a royal flush. They've got the unbeatable hand. In a post-historic world, they're going to start out with nothing. They're not even going to have two pair, two of a kind. They're not going to have two twos in their hand. They're not going to have a hand, period. Their poker hand is going to be worthless, and the only thing they can do with it is to bluff. But these are very talented people, and they know how to manipulate and beguile very well. And so if they can get us to sell our birthright for a bowl of lentils, then we will become a slave species. And, uh, you know, so for me, the real imperative here it's just not that people survive. But for me, the imperative here is about being in it for the species. Because if the meek do not inherit the earth, the psychopaths will. And that's really what's at stake here, fellas. Meek and that's does what not we mean weak. If you go and you research the etymology of the word, and here's a classic case of disinformation. The modern dictionaries all give these very diminutive, you know, dismissive, negative, uh, interpretations of me. If you go to the etymology of the word, you'll find that it first came into existence during the 12th century. And at that time, if you were called meek, it was one heck of a compliment. It meant you were a stout-hearted person, you were a survivor, you were someone that 
would be a member of a survival community committed to service to others and uh, seeking harmony with the world around you and uh, within yourself. And so when you look at the 12th century original etymology of the term as it was coined, uh, that is the profile of the meek who will inherit the earth, period. They will be the, they're good people. They're the people you want to have for neighbors. And they're the people that are going to work for you. It's, they're not going to subscribe to the survival of the fittest dog eat dog. That paradigm is going to go away. And we are going to realize as a result of all of this that we live in a sanctuary of life called earth. And that we have to be the good and kind stewards of this sanctuary, which includes all forms of life, including our own. And this is the lesson humanity, if humanity learns this lesson and embraces it, the elites are anachronisms. They're toast. That's it. Game over for them. They're not going to, you know, they're going to be buggy whips in a post-historic world. But if on the other side, you know, everyone's going, oh, man, you can tell me what Beyonce has been doing for the last 10 years? Where do I sign? You know, if we're doing that, then that's it. Future generations are screwed. I got, I got tickets for a Lady Gaga concert. You want to go? <laughs> <laughs> really? You know, Your so would start that, killing that's each what's other really to go at with stake that. here is that it's, you know, we're going to, yeah, we're going to have a flyby. Uh, the pole shift, uh, you know, what we're seeing in the data that we're looking at is that first off, the objects are already visible. We have images. We've posted them. We, we've had one man in North Carolina who has made legitimate observations of Nibiru, not once, but twice. Other people have. It's just that we don't report everything that we get because we just, we set a very high criteria for what we publish. You know, it has to be something. First off, um, you have to observe it with your own eyes. And when you send us a picture, you're sending us a picture of what you have observed with your own eyes. It has to be a naked eye observation. That's one. Two, it has to have good resolution, no less than eight megapixels. You're sending us something from an old cell phone camera, forget about it, we're not interested. Um, likewise, you know, we get pictures from people all the time that are interesting pictures of Nibiru, very interesting pictures. And what do they, when we ask them about it, they say, well, a friend of mine took this, what do you think about it? And all we can say back to them is, well, very conclusively, it looks like a picture your friend took. And that's all we can say. We don't use it. We're not going to post it. I'm not going to mention it to anyone. And then the third criteria is, are you going to come forward and put your face on it? And here's where we've had a lot of really terrific images, and I won't use them. Because the people who are saying, well, I took it, but oh, you know, oh, and I, I don't want to be mocked. I don't want to be ridiculed. I could lose my job if they see I, you know, I, I don't use it. And then I, thank you very much. I file it away. If you're not going to stand up, put your name and your face on it. Give me an interview over the phone that I can record and post in a video. We got nothing to talk about. Is he seeing the moon or Venus or something else? And he thinks he's seen or she has seen Nibiru. And so we do our due diligence. We comb through this thing with a fine tooth comb. And uh, that's the, you know, that's what we did with Richard Bolarup's report that we uh, put into our report, Nibiru Nearing. You, you so, know, you know, you know if we put it up, because if you put up anything else, all it does is it feeds the, it, it feeds the disinformation and the uh, lack of uh, integrity in the reporting we see el el elsewhere. You have to have the data, and and that's yeah. that's something that I appreciate about, or that you've kept my interest, uh, because you've provided better data over the years. And, and last year, in July, I did a vid video, uh, 2013, 2017. The end of July, you came out with the, the date for Nibiru, or, or the approximate date for Nibiru, the, the time period that we could look forward to, and somewhere right about the beginning of 2016, first second quarter. Yeah, 2016, I think sometime in 2016 it's going to be visible from most every point, if not every point on the globe. Uh, the pole shift is going to happen after that when it is impossible to say because these objects really defy what we have defined as celestial laws. Um, you have, uh, you know, it's coming in and it, it depends where this mini constellation is. The speed of this mini constellation is going to vary as depending where it is 
in its orbit. And there are so many variables. And I point this out in the video. Uh, there's just so many variables. But, you know, earlier um, we were talking uh, about uh, Michael was talking about uh, that thing he saw from NASA. Well, in my video, Pole Shift, what I show is there is a NASA astronomer by the name of Anderson who's currently on payroll or is close to retiring. And in not one, but two interviews with the media, you know, uh, with prestigious newspapers, he acknowledged the existence of Nemesis, a dark star, and uh, or a brown dwarf in this case, and the existence of Nibiru. So we have, and, and once we did that, NASA went to war on me. And that's the reason why if you go to Amazon, you'll see all my books are perpetually, temporarily out of stock. And uh, they're using that to muffle and silence our work so that people don't want to see it. Again, remember, yeah, think about this from the standpoint of the elites. You want to come up after the disaster with your baubles and bangles and your beads, and you want to get the natives to sign away their freedom and to willingly accept slavery. Well, you can't set aside enough baubles and beads to entice 7 billion people. But a half a billion people is workable. Okay. According to so, the government's own statistics, shut off the electricity for two years and you'll reduce the population in the United States by 90%. That's right. What they want, look, the, the reason why there's so much suppression, the reason why there's so much manipulation and social programming is that there's a simple goal to ensure the maximum possible dieback. That's it. The more people that, are, that die the better the elites like, like it. They don't care if one in 12 of us walks out of this thing and the, and the rest of us die along the way because what do, they, what do we all know about human beings? We breed like rabbits, okay? I mean, for God's sakes, we went from 2 billion to over 7 billion just in, in less than a century. If we live forever, we could populate our own planet. You know, I mean, yeah. I mean, we, <laughs> we're prolific, you know. We are prolific, so... You know, the thing is, it's not about the numbers. They don't, you know, they view us no more passionately than we do farm-raised trout. Uh, yeah, that's why there's the term Goyam cattle that, you know, sometimes it, it hey, typically you chip a cattle. And the RFID chip that they're talking about putting into people under the Obamacare Act that's supposed to be carried out by 2017, eh, I say let them, care, let, let them try It'll be interesting to see what happens you don't after want the passing of the boo room. You know, let, me, let me tell you about this, Peter, okay? Because uh, you're a man. You, you value your relationship with Creator. Absolutely. Right? Now, the chips, they're going to say the chips are for identification purposes. Yep. And they're not going to start chipping people now while, you know, we're watching Dancing with the Stars and Walmart is stocked to the shelves, okay? They're going to start chipping people when life's hard, when you can't get medicine or food. And then you're going to go to, that's when you go to Walmart and they're going to say, run your chip through the scanner. Oh, you don't have a chip? Sorry. Uh, we have to just put your stuff back on the shelf. Yeah, that's when you're going to get your government cheese and your chips. And the that's chips right. are going to be now, Doritos. The chips, okay, actually have three functions. You know, I learned, uh, learned about all three of them from a whistleblower. And uh, after she told me this, uh, they, they found her and they muffled her. But what she told me, because it was really breaking her heart, is that these chips are going to be identifiers, but they're bidirectional, okay? They go both ways. They send information, receive information. So they're sending information about you. They're transmitting your identity and background information. But then they're receiving other information, which is going to be cloud computing style of programming, where when you're chipped, what you don't realize is that your chip is now turning you into a radio receiver for social programming. And they don't, they're not going to have to even bother with getting, you know, armies of people to manipulate us on YouTube discussion channels in the place. They'll just pump it directly into your brain. But here's the third thing that the chips are going to do is that the chips are going to be able to set up barrier frequencies. They have identified the, connect, the, the frequencies by which we communicate with God, like the way God touches us in our lives and gives us dreams, visions, and premonitions. They will turn that off. 
So once you've been chipped, uh, you're going to be socially programmed to be more passive, more adaptive, and your, your, your connection to God is going to be completely severed. Now, they're doing that because in a, an elitist view of the world, you only have value as long as you're doing something they is that's going to profit them and B, that you are reliably docile and subservient. So if you are an independent kind of a person, you're not going to be reliably uh, docile and, subvers- and, and subservient. And so people could be living along, once they're chipped, they're living along coastlines and what are they going to broad? You know, what are they going to broadcast into these people? Oh, just stay where you are. It's wonderful. Stay where you are. It's wonderful. Stay Shel- where you are. It's wonderful. And then that's in it. Place. Shelter in place, and then they die. So, there are the evil things that I see that are going to start unfolding, uh, and they're going to start unfolding and bringing these things out when people are panicked and hungry and can't get medicine. And at that point, they're going to be completely unprepared for what's coming, and they're going to have to take what's offered. And what's offered is going to be starve to death or have your heart attack or you get a chip. And once you're chipped, you're chipped. Uh, There's three kinds of chips that they're going to use. There's going to be the uh, subdermal implants, about the size of a large grain of rice. Uh, if you are if you are forced to be chipped, that's the one that you want to take. The other one is going to be a thermal transfer. It'll be like a tattoo. They'll put it on your forehead, and then uh, there'll be a circuit that will just etch itself into your skin like an invisible tattoo. And the only way you can remove that is just remove the skin from your head. Uh, and then the third kind are going to be infant implants. And at the top of the skull, there's a couple of very soft areas where the child at birth has is very soft tissue in the skull in order to come through the birth canal. And when a child is born, they'll immediately insert a specialized chip into that area, at which point it's impossible to extract the chip. And that, that child is chipped for life. And that's where they really want to go. They're going to want to chip all of the newborns that way. Like so my, this, my, is, this is what's right. coming down the pike. And um, they, these are the things that they just, just don't want people to know. All right. And uh, if people do know, then, it, you know, it, 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 the whole situation takes on a completely different spin. Uh, but, again, the problem is, all right, you have this knee-jerk denial reaction, which is, you know, which is exactly what, I mean, I am not a Bible person, but I do read the esch- Christian eschatology, and it's like, you know, the more I study it, the more it's like it's a preparatory for these times. And the more I look at it, the more, excuse me if it offends anybody, but I don't think many Christians really understand their own Bible. They, I don't think they understand the eschatology that well, because I, I, I all they right. depend on is someone who's explaining it to them, and the explanations that they're getting are designed in many cases to bis- to, to be you know, uh, misinforming or incomplete. It's the, um, church, so, it's the church dogma that they're actually getting. And they're not getting the actual teachings that are written in the Bible. That, that's one right. great advantage that I have. I never learned the church dogma. No, no yeah. religious dogma was taught to me. It was taught to me in a, in a matter of exopolitics where other dimensional beings were involved. Cherish, yeah. Cherish, other angels, archangels, God. A, a, and, you know, I was taught by people who had a special calling let's leave it at that for, for this show and they didn't give me any other special instructions except learn this learn this yeah. so, well yeah. i'm sorry don't get involved in earth politics don't get involved in earth religion and the last thing that i was told was that my future was in the stars which i finally came to understand when, when i wrote letters to earth are good people and the majority of the people would look at that young 15 year old girl and see a human being with a lot of potential but there's, it's the ones that are malevolent and self-serving, and they are in the minority. They are the ones that have the megaphones. And so the louder the message is, the more evil the person behind the megaphone is. I believe it was George Green who did a video uh, on Project Camelot and said his awakening moment was when his daughter, they were in Aspen, Colorado, and he was with uh, Ted Kennedy. And his daughter, who was 14 at the time, came walking through the door and Kennedy said, I'd like to have that. And George looked at him and said, no, you wouldn't. He said, that's my daughter. And Kennedy said, so? 
<laughs> yeah. yeah now, now I'm quoting this the best I can. You can go look it up. At, go find. No, I remember Project this interview. Team. Yeah. Oh, you that get, they're, they're salivating right now with all these these uh, Mexican uh, kids yeah, being pushed like across the border. They got a lot of agenda there, but this is like a pinata for pedophiles now. But, but now I, I want to point something out. Eighty percent of the Earth's population live within 90 miles of the coast. Think of the logistics problem it would be to move those people to a safe location inland. 80%. Now, now think about places like Bangladesh, which is, uh, I can't imagine how many million people you have living at, at uh, basically coastline or coast levels. Uh, but there's so many, if you look at the Southeast Asia and, and the, the Fiji Islands, Micronesia, uh, you start sloshing the oceans around, these places are going to vanish. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the average height of Fiji is seven feet above sea level. Yeah. They're yeah. toast. Yeah. And they want these, you know, the thing is, they just, they just simply, the elites simply want to reduce the global population to more manageable numbers. And so, They'll use any combination of things, wars, disease, plague, it doesn't matter. Once the party starts, they're going to want people to die, and they're going to want them to die in vast numbers. And the ones that are going to be uh, the fastest to go are the ones living along the coastlines. Now, that's the reason why you know, I moved to Reno. All right? I relocated because I knew it was just time to bust a move. You think we're going to have and some record-breaking hurricanes uh, this season? I, You know, there's so much weather manipulation, it's hard to say. I mean, we very well could. I mean, what I see happening here on the West Coast is California has already been written off. Um, you have Nancy Pelosi, who has gone to Congress, to ask Congress to set aside special funding for disaster fund for California because they are already looking at this drought and forest fires and rising sea levels. And the reason why is the jet stream has been moved with all the chemtrail spraying. I, I, you know, I find it just boggles my mind there are people that still deny chemtrail spraying. I mean, I look over my, I can see squadrons of these jets laying checkerboard patterns in the sky. Oh, it's sick. Um, Marshall, and, and, I, I was one of those people who denied chemtrails. I was like, Come I remember on. that. Uh, chemtrails really looking at vapor trails. And then I said, okay, well, let's go look at what they're putting in jet fuel. So I, I looked up the formula for jet fuel. And, and they, I, I'm reading barium. Why are they putting barium in jet fuel? And that made absolutely no sense. And, and so now I have to start questioning, okay, if they're putting barium in jet fuel, what else is actually going on? And I started investigating, and I started looking up at, in the sky, and I started saying, okay, uh, vapor trails vanish. Those, those things are getting bigger. Well, first off, you I, know, I couldn't be in you denial. see these I things, they, they lay a pattern in the sky, and these things are just persistent for hours, okay? They're not like contrails. Contrails evaporate. These things are persistent. They stay in the sky for hours. And yeah, what they're doing they is that they're, they're shifting the jet stream, all right? And because they want to get moisture, they want to get more moisture into the Midwest because this is where Monsanto and all these guys have got all their big bucks invested in these, you know, these uh, in soy, wheat, corn. They want the water for this area. Now, the result is. The jet stream, remember, you know, uh, there was a famous quote from Samuel Clemens, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. Well, the reason for that was it used to be that the jet stream came down from the Arctic, and it used to go in exactly where uh, the Golden Gate Bridge is. All right? That was, a jet stream came in to that point and cut across. And that was the reason why the summers in San Francisco were always so cold, because you'd have the ice melt, and uh, then you would have all of this cold air come rushing down in and boom. Well, the jet stream has been hijacked so that instead of it coming down into San Francisco, it actually comes down and goes over the top of British Columbia and then down so that it's, the jet stream has literally been deformed so that it brings the moisture down into the Midwest. That's the reason why the Midwest is having 
these colder winters, a uh, lot more rain, a lot more bizarre weather. They have more cold, more wet, that kind of stuff. Now, I've had people call me from British Columbia to tell me last winter, they normally in British Columbia in the winter will have four to six feet of snow. Last winter, they had no snow, none, 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 just occasional rains. And as a result of that, shallow wells in British Columbia were going dry and the salmon runs were down 75%, all right? Completely devastating local economies up there. Do we hear about that on CNN or MSNBC or Fox? No, we get, we know what Beyonce is scratching her took us to do today, all right? That's it. <laughs> And um, so we don't, you know, all of this is going on because they're moving it. Now, January 1st, I was walking through the surf in Santa Cruz when I decided to bust a move because in, I lived there for 18 years. January in Santa Cruz was always leather jacket, wool scarf, leather gloves, a wool cap, an umbrella. Okay, you always were dealing with cold and with, with wet. There I am, tank top, shorts, and I'm walking knee deep through the surf on January the 1st, like I would in August. Wow. Okay, now it was nice to walk, but it was also, hello, what's wrong with this picture? So I moved to Reno in mid February. Now, Reno in mid February is got snow. I came up, when I moved up here, it was shirt sleeve weather, beautiful weather. Matter of fact, uh, you know, no people up here in Truckee, Donner Pass area, and like British Columbia, they would have several feet of snow. You drive down the roads and you see the snow stakes that are set for three feet and six feet with the reflectors. No snow this winter, none, 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 none. Donner Pass doesn't have a very good reputation for being nice weather. Yeah, you know, remember Donner Pass, Donner Pass Party of 50, Donner Pass Party of 49, Donner Pass Party of 48, you know, uh, that was where all those people uh, died and, you know, cannibalism was uh, happening up there. That's a real cold place. And when you get up there, I mean, even, in, you know, there's, there's, there's some snow on the ground, but not too much. And um, this is, you know, the weather modification that's going on is, is extremely profound. Uh, in California, I was talking with a man who worked with the, par the Forest Service down there. Uh, his job was uh, when they come across trees that need to be cut down to make a fire break, and it's a real gnarly tree that just the, the regular guys look at it and go, man, I'm afraid it's going to fall on me. I'm not going to do it. They bring him in. He's the troubleshooter. He's been doing it for 30 years. This guy's a maestro with a chainsaw. And he said, what we're seeing now that really is freaking us out is the redwoods have gotten so dry, they're burning. People get redwood for their decking and for their trims on their house because this stuff is not only bug resistant, it doesn't burn. All right. Redwood trees, you see redwood trees that have been in a fire, it's the bark, it's the outer rings of the tree. The inner rings of the tree are there. And matter of fact, the fire is what the redwoods depend on to initiate their procreation cycle. So there's all of these signs. But if everyone's busy going to Walmart and watching Dancing with the Stars and they're oblivious to what's happening in the world around them, they're indifferent. They don't care. I'll worry. You know, it's like Scarlett O'Hara. I'll worry about that tomorrow. Yeah. And I was just saying in the chat room, I says, I'm willing to bet because of Fukushima and then what BP did. I mean, you put those two together, I think that there's probably – a shortage of life within the ocean, and I'm betting that there's going to be a lot more shark attacks. Um, in well, the first off, I think that what we're going to see within a few years is the complete death and annihilation of the Pacific Ocean. Oh, I agree. In the meantime, uh, though, I think the sharks. No, are going to I be mean it there. is. Fukushima is a disaster that is out of control. There's a guy who had got a YouTube channel, and uh, I follow him, and is is called Nibiru Magic 2012. And this guy's just an old hippie kind of looking fella. And uh, he reads news headlines on what's really happening there. And, I, I, and he's, he's quoting reliable sources. And, you know, the point here is 
it's a disaster. The coriums melted through the reactors one, two, and three. The coriums are in the ground. It's China syndrome. Which, and there's an underground river, and they tried to dam up the underground river, and the dam failed. And so it is a catastrophe that is out of control. It is just going to keep pumping radiation into the Pacific. And this is, you know, they give us these, well, there's more radiation in a banana. You yeah. get more radiation if you French kiss a cell phone charger and so forth. Uh, this is all, I mean, it's really sick. When you see scientists talking like propagandists, you know, it's like, hello, you know, the Nazis are back, <laughs> alive and well. Uh, these guys are right out of the Joseph Goebbels playbook. Radiation but, is good for you. Yeah, radiation is good for you. Yeah, and uh, there's more the, radiation in a banana, you know. Isn't and, that what the bimbo said uh, there's, on the You know, they're already seeing uh, deformities, early deaths, uh, all kinds of problems in fisheries on the West Coast. This is already happening. Um, and the thing about this radiation that's coming out of Fukushima, it, this is going to keep pumping for hundreds of years. And it is not something that, you know, they, they've given people this idiotic thought that, well, it just, it's, it, it's like waste, you know, it eventually evaporates and uh, just, you know, it'll go away. It'll go away. Nature will clean it up. In what about, about 40,000 years. In about 40,000 years. This stuff is additive. It just, it keeps adding to, not only does it keep adding to itself, but in the process of accumulating, it comes, it, it, new forms of it evolve, and it becomes even more toxic. And so what we're going to see is uh, we're going to see the death of the Pacific Ocean. There's no question in my mind. Uh, Fukushima is going to, and, and it will eventually have impacts for the other bodies of water. Um, it will be primarily, you know, uh, contained in the northern hemisphere because this is the way the currents carry things. But um, what's going to happen when all of a sudden cities along the co West Coast start putting up radiation warning signs? Don't swim. Yeah, well, that's if they ever yeah, I was going to say, if they do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> one of the things, we're facing this, and, and here this comes into what we would biblically call the Armageddon event. However... A lot of people never make it past this point. It's like, oh, it's the end of the world. Why bother? No, wait a minute. It's not the end of the world. It's the end of the world system. And it's, that's right. It's the end of the world as we know it. And frankly, yeah. that's not going to be a bad thing. I mean, we humanity really needs to learn that God has given us a sanctuary of life called planet Earth, and we need to be good and noble stewards. Now, exactly. Now, if you if you read, look at the prophecies on how they're actually set up during the, these times, it's after the Nibiru event that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords returns with the armies of the multiverse. Okay, uh, I gotta imagine that since this is the Loyalist Force, they outnumber the Rebels two to one, that uh, they're also probably gonna bring advanced technology with them to um, maybe neutralize the radiation and a lot of the pollution on this planet. It's all possible just by changing the vibration of the actual uh, string within the atomic structure itself. So change the vibration of the string, according to string theory, it's there, and you'll change the vibration of that structure, making it inert. So the technology might be on its way. And, and this is where... From your lips to God's ears, Peter. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's not necessarily all doom and gloom. And when you look at, at uh, you know, I, I read earlier uh, about where it says in Revelation uh, chapter 6, but you go to Revelation chapter 19, where it talks about the return of the King of Kings. It's in the 17th verse. It says that there's an angel that stands in uh, that's in mid heaven, and he calls all the birds together for the evening feast of God. And the same ones that the, the kings, the rulers, the rich people, and all their support staff, uh, they become bird food. So works uh, for me, baby. That and, works for me. And, and you know the great thing is. We are building flocks of meat-eating seagulls with our garbage dumps. Yeah, it makes you wonder about Alfred Hitchcock and uh, the movie The Birds. Oh, The Birds, yeah. yeah. Well, that takes me back. Yeah, so <laughs> you know, th think about eighty percent of the world's population not being told what in the world is going on. Uh, it's finally last minute. Okay, folks, you got to get off the coast because Nabooru is here, and uh, you're going to get washed off if you don't get off. And so you got these people in a mad rush, all trying to get off the coast, killing each other to get out of the way. 
And, and meanwhile, they're not going to let him do it. That's yeah. when, you know, I, I've had this actually. They'll get as far as the Delaware Reno, River. <laughs> this is a real, you know, the funny thing is when I moved into Reno, and I, and I tell people, if you relocate to an area, you want to go to some place where you feel like it's home. And you when I came it. to Reno, I fell in love with it because it, it's 40% original Reno and 60% people who come from California. And the folks that are, are, are native to Reno are the very same kind of people I grew up in Phoenix in the 1960s with. And, I, and they're wonderful, easygoing, uh, cordial people, tough as nails. I really like them. And uh, the folks from California that are here are the folks that I always wanted to meet in California and couldn't find. I mean, they got Reno got the cream of the crop. And, uh, you know, so there's a diverse much. culture here. I love it. Sure. It's wonderful. And, you know, the conversation I have, there's so many folks here that, that are into this topic. Guys, we're, we're, just go, about, man, I'm just, we're just about out of time. So, Marshall, I, I, I hate to rush you like this, but we're down to just a minute and a half. So please uh, go ahead and get out anything that you'd like. Uh, and I thank you so much for coming back. The time just flies. Really does. Yes, uh, for those of you who are new to the topic, please check out my new video series, Planet X 101. You can see it at planetx101.com. That's planetx101.com. Also, read our latest article. It's time to look up at yowusa.com, yowusa.com. And the thing here. And I want you to remember is we can't beat the elites. The future is for the meek, but not by default. We have to claim it. And all we have to do to claim it is to call the bluff. And you know, I love that, Marshall, because you look at the scripture in Matthew 24, and Jesus said that those times would be so difficult that if it wasn't for the chosen ones, no one would be left. back peter we're back and marshall i thought maybe uh in this last hour we could talk about where it is well, when we expect its arrival and what people should be doing whether they believe that this is coming or not it's not a bad idea to prepare but go ahead uh -oh, hold on just a second before we turn marshall loose uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> whoa big fella <laughs> something i do want to say and and, and here i I always give credit where credit is due, and I want to say kudos to Marshall on his work. Uh, just about a year ago, it'll be a year ago in the beginning of July, that I did a, a, uh, an interview with Alfred Weber uh, on the 2013 to 2017 timeline. And in that timeline, I laid out the Tetrid Moons, which we have entered as of this year, and as I said earlier, and the different events that we could expect to happen under the Tetrid Moon cycle as it comes around. Now, the fact that, th that they are tetrad moons is unusual enough. In other words, there are four full lunar eclipses in a row without any partial lunar eclipses at all. Uh, interestingly enough, during the same time period, there are four solar eclipses, two full, two partial. Uh, the full solar eclipse, uh, the, the next so full solar eclipse happens on Nisan 1, 2015, uh, two weeks before the blood moon of Passover. So you've got these, now, now the, the, what's even more bizarre is that this started off on a synchronization with the Gregorian calendar of essentially the same date, April 14th, Nisan 14th. Uh, never happened before. Uh, the blood moons are unusual enough, but now they're all on Hebrew holidays, the two most high holidays of the Hebrew calendar year, for two years in a row. Extremely unusual. They end on a, the day before the historic, the, the most accepted historic date for Jesus' birth. They end on October, tw I'm sorry, on September 28th. The, the accepted, the most historic accepted date for Jesus' birth is September 29th. The, the following uh, uh, Passover is misdated. It's coming a month late. However, I'm going to go back to, to this video that, that we did, and, and you can make reference to it because it's not about the, the timeline. It's about specifically about this event. Uh, he, he, here's the situation. The timeline falls out almost perfectly for what Revelation 6, 12 through 17 could only be described as, as the Nibiru event. 
and that's what makes this so peculiar uh, in, in not a uh, strange way, but in a timing of events. I don't believe in coincidence. Coincidences are two things happening at the same time. But let's look for historic precedent. And when we do, we the, the, the last historic president, precedent was at the time of Egypt's uh, the, the uh, liberation of the tribe of Israel from Egyptian control back during the Exodus. But the, the, interesting, when you read the wording that is used by Ju in uh, Revelation, the sixth chapter, uh, in the 12th verse, it's interesting how it starts off. And then, Marshall, I'm gonna, after I read this, I'm going to leave this to you. Okay. It, sa it says that, I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth like a green figs falling from trees shaken by mighty winds. And the sky was rolled up like a scroll and taken away. And all of the mountains and all of the islands disappeared. And the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy people, the people with great power, and every slave and every free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rock masses of the mountains. And they cried out to the mountains and to the rocks, fall over us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to survive? Now, uh, when you go back to the first Gulf War, Norman Sch Schwarzkopf carried out what was called shock and awe. He took out his enemy's eyes, he took out his enemy's ears and speech, and then he took out his enemy, and that war was measured in hours, not weeks, months, or years. Of course, it led to a war that's yeah. never ending there since. But you see, once this Nibiru event or Planet X event happens, we can pretty much kiss all communications goodbye. And the event itself is timed according to the prophecies. And, and so I cannot ignore your message, Marshall. I cannot ignore it. I can't and, either because it's hard data, and, and I love that stuff. It's like it's, Yeah, it's synchronicity. It's, is it coincidence? It's one hell of a coincidence, yeah, because it's, it's this event which takes out the eyes and ears of the military and all their advanced weapons and all their goodies that they intend uh, on using against the people and whoever might be showing up, and it puts everything in the hands of a higher power. Think about that. An off-planet higher power. Call it what you want, but we are going to be impressed with what happens by the time it's all over, at least those of us who survive it. Well, you know, that's that's my bag is, you know, I want people to survive it. What I see, and, and I talk about this in this article, it's time to look up on my site. I posted it this morning on yowza.com, Y-O-W-U-S-A.com, and I really give people the big bada bing of what's really important, why they should be looking. And uh, because in my video, I have a guy from, uh, North Carolina, Richard Bowler, who made two observations of Nibiru, and uh, the chemtrail spring was really hard, and so he got to see it in between chemtrail spring from two different locations in the same city on two different dates. And uh, the interesting thing was we correlated those two being in the same area of the sky as we were observing Nibiru from Turialba, and we also show that in the video. But what I'm the point I'm trying to get across to people is that when I look at what the elites are doing, I see a completely different scenario than what I see with the common man. The common man is just all over the map, and they're in denial, and they don't want to. And, you know, interestingly enough, the Bible tells us exactly that's what's going to happen. People are going to be deceived because they want to be deceived. Um, and it's going to be the rare few that are not. Uh, so it's a pandemic of denial. But for the elites, uh, they've got a long-term strategy. And... What they're seeing is right now in the present day world, 